We're on a mission from God. Wendy? So I got that going. Darling? Looks like I picked the wrong week to quit sniffing blue. Light of my life. We enjoy your films. I am a human being. I thought they smelled bad on the outside. Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're rewatching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in real time, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today marks the 40th anniversary of the release of How to Beat the High Cost of Living on July 11th, 1980. It was written by Robert Kaufman, based on a story by Leonora Thuna, directed by Robert Shearer, and released by American International. Can you guess the original title? Hint, it was used by another movie later. Rollerball? <laughs> so close. Moneyball? Moneyball! Oh, okay. It's the original title. Uh, in 1975, the film was ready to go with Carol Burnett, Jane Fonda, and Glenda Jackson. Burnett dropped out and was replaced with Shirley MacLaine. Yeah. And then the film moved to Fox, where the leads were swapped for Goldie Hawn, Ali McGraw, and Barbara Streisand. Oh, I think I would have liked that better. They were also considering Anne Margaret. I don't know which role, but one of the three. And according to IMDb, over the almost decade of pre-production, other actresses considered for the parts were Faye Dunaway, Raquel Welch, Jane Fonda, Dolly Parton, Diane Keaton, Margot Kidder, Mary Tyler Moore, Julie Andrews, Diane Cannon, Sally Field, Goldie Hawn, Madeline Kahn, Terry Garr, Jill Clayburgh. So they went through a lot of people before mm-hmm. they settled so, on. Well, hold on a second. So this movie was in pre-production for potentially a decade yeah the first draft was written in 71 71 yeah because i thought it was incredibly timely because it has to do with extreme inflation Mm -hmm. which was happening in 1980 so i was just like wow they really got this script off the ground fast and got it out there but you're telling me this was written in 1970 and they just predicted that in 1980 it would have incredibly high inflation it turns out that over the course of human history people have always needed money and no, but so, specifically the the high inflation plot point. Well, it went through eleven rewrites over the course of the decade. I guess the they decade, could have added so, that in later. Yeah, it, they just tried to make it timely at the last second by adding that to it. But I think originally it was just a heist movie. Actually, Alan Arkin was going to direct it originally. I think if it was actually a heist movie and nothing else, it might have actually been pretty good. Yeah, but it was not that. But yeah, Alan Arkin dropped off. Herbert Ross, who directed Nijinsky, was attached for a while. I don't think that would have worked very well either. Fox, Warner Brothers, and eventually Universal all turned the film down, and it ended up being the last American international release after a disappointing year that started well with Mad Max, but then shout out Defiance, Nothing Personal, and Gorp. Three truly reprehensible garbage heaps. Uh, American International was then acquired by Filmways, who fared much better in 1980 on the strength of Dress to Kill alone, but they had other good movies at the time. After the success of Love at First Bite, also starring Susan St. James and Richard Benjamin, the screenwriters were able to get American International to agree to a younger, less established cast. So that's how we ended up with these three. But would you really consider uh, Jane Curtin not established yet? This was her first feature film. Well, so but, yes. but, but, but she was, Yeah, she was yeah. on tons of SNL. But established means that you have a film career and she did not. She had done Weekend Update. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I think that's established. You put you put Seth Meyers in a, a movie now, and I'd be like, yeah, he's established, and he hasn't he's had a not. film career. <laughs> Seth Meyers is not established as a, as a film actor. Nah. I, I wouldn't buy a ticket to that movie <laughs> because I've only seen him read news jokes. That's all I've seen from him. <laughs> Jane, you ignorant slut. <laughs> so apparently somebody yelled that at the set as they were driving by when they saw Jane Curtin, and the IMDb trivia says that everybody laughed about it, and I was like, Everybody except for Jane Curtin, because I guess she gets that every fucking where she goes, and it's probably super annoying to yeah. her that she's like with her kids at the grocery store, and someone's like, "Jane, you ignorant slut," and she's like, I'm "Fucking here with my kids, what is your problem?" Fifty years ago, yeah. <laughs> How are you still alive? How am I still alive? Apparently, the money ball in the film actually contained two hundred and forty thousand dollars of real money. So I was wrong. <laughs> I, I was going to say all that money looked real legit. Yeah, it, because the cinematographer said people can tell when they see fake money, especially when it's moving. And so really? they, they were like, 
it has to be real money. So they borrowed two hundred forty thousand dollars from a bank to use for this. Borrowed. I, I mean, d- I guess. Yeah. Um, we start the film with an animated sequence of a dollar with wings and a girl is chasing it when she passes a second girl whose money is all sucked up along with her clothes by an anthropomorphized pump at a gas station. Uh, The pump then transforms into a glaring cash register who swallows the clothes and money of a third woman. The three women together dive into a pet hospital that looks like a small doghouse and a vet carrying a puppy comes out the other side. The women hold a garage sale, which is attended by the IRS who steals the garage. The newly uncovered car looks angry and demands to eat all of the things that they're selling at the garage sale, as well as their clothes again, because their clothes keep reappearing. It barfs up three bicycles for some reason and clothes for them, and then it drives away. They ride the bicycles to a butcher shop where they try to move the price tags around to cheat the proprietor, but he doesn't fall for it, and so they leave. Outside, a caricature of what looks like Ayatollah Kamini steals their bikes and rides away. Uh, and the girls yell after him and then walk away from camera as we fade to live action. So I, I do have to say, though, that I think that this animation does a fabulous job of setting up the movie in how terrible and sexist it is throughout. Yeah. Um, I also like that in addition to the, the poster, which is like the three of them standing naked in a barrel, that they're like, sex appeal, come on, these mm-hmm. ladies are all going to get naked. And it's like... There's one scene where there's like mild nudity and it's not any of these three actresses. Yeah, it's clearly it's, a body double. So it's like, what? Why? Why did you intentionally disappoint your audience like that? But uh, hey, if they're in the theater, they already paid for it. This is true. Uh, we zoom into a neighborhood and then a home and then eventually a garage before we push through the garage door to find Jane and Robert sleeping in the back of a car. Jane tells Robert that she is late, which reminds him that he should get moving toward work. Just to be clear, this character is named Jane, but is not Jane Curtin. Right. Yeah. And that is very annoying through the rest of the movie when she's talking yep. to Jane and Jane's calling her Jane. And not to mention that there's a character that sounds like Jane named Elaine. Yeah. And that doesn't help either. <laughs> Who is also, actually Jane. Yes. I also feel Curtin. like you shouldn't have a character named Elaine and a character named Louise in the same movie. Because there's, it's just like the na- the names. Every time I was typing them out, I was like mixing them up constantly. Yeah. Jane tells Robert she's late. Blah blah blah. Uh, <laughs> blah blah blah. She's pregnant with yeah. his child. Well, that's and, what, like, and, and, well and, they don't they don't <laughs> spell that out here. As far as we know, she might have just meant that she was late because all she says is I'm late, and he's like, Oh yeah, me too. I got to get going. And she's like, Do you love me? And then he says oh no i don't love you i just really like sleeping in your car that's why i come here all the time it's not because i love you it's because i love your freezing garage and having your kids call me uncle robert for two years and uh but apparently he's been dragging his feet about them getting married and she's trying to push him on the subject because i think she doesn't want to have a kid outside of wedlock but he says he's holding out for a promotion to manager at the store Uh, i think he's waiting for his boss to die or retire Um, how does that help anything I don't know, but apparently he thinks that it's like a monarchy and it will just fall to him. (laughs) Um, Because he'll make big bucks at this small hardware store. Yeah, he's going to be super rich. And then he can marry her because that makes all the difference. Yeah. Uh, Louise pulls up to an animal hospital where presumably she works. Oh, no, she just walked right past the counter and she's talking to her husband in the back. Uh, This is Albert, played by Richard Benjamin. He's in the back room and he instructs her to strip and climb on the table from behind a curtain. And she reminds him, uh, this is your wife, not one of your nurses or not your secretary or whatever she says. Albert and the puppy he is holding come around the corner and take turns licking Louise's face. (laughs) Uh, She's asking for money to dump into an antique store that she's been hemorrhaging cash at for two years now, or I guess three years. He tells her to her face that she's a perfect example of the women's lib movement, able to do whatever she wants as long as her husband pays for it. For some reason, he didn't expect this comment to backfire. Oh, because it doesn't. (laughs) Uh, He continues to mock her for the rest of the scene right up until they're making out again. Elaine pulls up to her home, and she brings in bags from shopping all the way to her bedroom, where she listens to a phone message. One is from her husband, apparently leaving her via a message on the phone. His new love interest is leaving the message with him, as he offers such platitudes as, There are plenty of other fish in the sea, and she smashes the phone and throws her ring off the balcony. A bank employee informs her that her husband took everything from their safety deposit box, all the accounts, 
and all the jewelry, but she still has $480 left on the Christmas Club card. Mm-hmm. I'm not familiar with Christmas Club cards. Uh well, f- and for some reason, she can't even use the money until December. Well, it seems like a forced saving program where it's yeah. like you put this money aside so that you don't accidentally spend it before you need to buy gifts. Uh, also, it's weird that he, I guess, no, I, I was going to say, like, you think he would leave her the jewelry, but I guess he wants to give it to his new right. lady love. Yeah, it's great. He can get laid twice with the same jewelry. Apparently, she can't access that money till December 10th, which is probably why he didn't take it. And the banker tries to assure her that he will come back, to which she replies, What makes you think I want the rotten son of a bitch back? Uh, Elaine has to pay house and car payments Monday, and she has no money. I don't know why she has to pay house and car payments if the house and car aren't hers. Because they already told her that she couldn't sell them. Yeah, because they're community property. So, they're not hers. Well, I guess she needs the car to get around. Right, but... If they repossess the car or the house... But aren't they in her husband's name? Right, but they can still repossess them. Why would he want that? Why would he want his house repossessed? Because he's moved on he's with moved another on. lady. So he's okay with losing hundreds of thousands of dollars so he doesn't have to talk to his ex-girlfriend anymore or ex-wife? Apparently. I, I don't understand the logic of it because they try and make it. It's like, oh, there is there is like you have things, but you don't have anything. And it's like, well, no, she either has a house or she doesn't. If she doesn't have the house, then someone else is paying for it. And if they're not paying for it, then it's their loss, not hers. I, I completely agree with you, but in the in the universe of this movie, that's yeah. not how things work. Yeah, this guy literally just was like, screw it. I'm just going to let these things get repossessed. I don't care about that house or that car. I, I guess things would be clearer if there was terms of a divorce. Or but, if you ever saw this guy in the whole movie. <laughs> yeah, uh, but uh, no, no, because she's selling all of his stuff. Yeah, she's allowed to sell everything but the car and the house because they're not hers. But then she shouldn't also be in charge of paying for those things then. But uh, she begs this bank for credit extensions and she's not getting anywhere because the woman at the bank says they only loan money to people who don't need it. Albert sits in the side office of the bank and uh, he's getting audited by the IRS. They refer to his wife's business repeatedly as a hobby and they explain that the amount of money that he has loaned her business and the lack of profit it has shown makes it not a legitimate business. But it's open six days a week and it has an employee and expenses and everything. Like yeah, I don't know how you can't prove this as a business. Yeah, you Just don't have to turn a profit to be a business. Yeah. <laughs> Restaurants yeah. don't turn a profit for years after they get started. Yeah. And, and spoiler alert, he gets that all corrected in the end. Anyway. Yeah, just deus ex machina. And I was just like, well, then just why didn't you just do that? Yeah. But uh, they they basically say that the government draws a line between a hobby and a business at the interest-free loan that he gave his wife to keep the store running. As a result of this interest-free loan, he now owes taxes on the $36,000 that he loaned her for the store because they aren't business expenses anymore. Uh, They'll need to prove that the store is legitimate in a hurry if they don't want to owe Uncle Sam tens of thousands of dollars. Elaine drowns her sorrows at a bar. Uh, She complains about her ex's 19-year-old replacement for her, and she blames herself for what went wrong. Apparently, he was an architect, and she repeatedly mocked his work, calling him Frank Lloyd Wrong. Um, It really... It Sorry. really bothers me how many times in this movie that the people who are having extreme money problems are at bars and restaurants. Yeah. Yeah, they, they're not good with money, obviously. At home, handing off the kids to her ex, Jane asks for more money and child support from her ex-husband. Uh, apparently, she's been getting by on $200 a month to keep the kids alive and sheltered, and it doesn't go as far as it did when they were tiny. He tells his wife that his life is hard, too, and she advises him to ask for a raise, but he's he's a coach for the football team at the high school, and he can't ask for a raise because the team sucks because he's probably a bad coach, but he also refuses to let his new wife work because her job is taking care of him. So the two of them are getting by on a bad football coach's salary, which is rough. He tells her that she's lucky she didn't end up like Elaine. I guess word travels fast because I thought that happened today. Back at the bar, Elaine drunkenly trips on a table on her way out, and the bartender is for some reason fine with her driving, uh, which she then does. She flips a Yui and blows a stop sign right in front of a cop, and the cop here is Dabney Coleman. And uh, she hands him her license, and he tells her what she did, and she invites him to have some coffee and a conversation, and he takes her up on it. She says, let's go to your place, and he said, oh, we can't do that. My wife's there. And she says, you're married? And he says, yeah, isn't everybody? 
and she gets mad that he would assume that she was also married which she is i think <laughs> uh and she flips out and starts assaulting him with her purse until he grabs her and threatens arrest which she should have already done because she drove drunk and blew a stop sign but he's trying to have sex with her that's true it's a toss-up she says go ahead and arrest me i know who i'll use my one call on she asks if he knows who she'll use the call on implying that she magically knows his wife's phone number or i don't know i don't i'm not even sure what she's implying here well i guess she could call information say can you connect me to officer (laughs) so-and-so's wife and that that this woman is going to believe a drunk driver that says hey just so you know i'm in jail but your husband hit on me and i guess i'm going to be here for a long time because i forgot to use my phone call wisely he just lets her go because he hates the innocent people in his neighborhood and and uh, he thinks that one of them might die tonight because of his actions jane and louise pull up to elaine's garage sale to get rid of her husband's shit because she's gonna lose the house soon uh <laughs> this was the only bit that i laughed out loud at was when she asked the guy if she wants if he wants a cup of coffee yeah he says, sure and so she pours it for him he says 25 cents so he just pours, <laughs> pours it, it back, back into the pot that's pretty great it turns out that she can't sell the house or the cars so the girls try to cheer elaine up by doing one of their old high school cheers and even all the shoppers are amused by this routine like everybody in the whole driveway is laughing and clapping at this song that they performed and then a shotgun goes off yeah a nearby fish tank explodes it was filled with live fish and it dumps them all into the driveway apparently a woman was considering buying a shotgun and accidentally fired it uh, Elaine begs the people to save the fish before turning on a dime to say hi to the shooter. Save the fish! <laughs> Hello, Natalie. Yeah, Natalie has stopped by to see if Elaine's changed her mind about helping out for the shopping center anniversary pageant. Uh, she wants this gun to protect herself because recently she's been followed home several times by someone. But this doesn't play a part in the rest of the movie. She just thinks she's being followed and she wants a gun. All around, Good Samaritans are collecting the fish in jars. And Natalie reminds Elaine that they are meeting to organize the pageant at her house on Monday morning. Elaine eventually wrestles the gun away from Natalie, but as the scene ends, she's pointing it straight at the chest of a nearby shopper. And I was really worried it was going to go off again. He turns to her and he offers her 10 bucks for a tennis racket. And she says, sure. And he says, say, did Millard have any bowls? And she looks at the smirking faces of her friends before admitting the joke is too easy. (laughs) No, I can't. It's too easy. Uh, in there, next to the freezer, the yellow can, all you can find, go with the racket, okay? She's very generous. Yeah. Like... It's not her stuff. (laughs) Well, yeah, yeah, but she needs the money. Yeah. For how natural the dialogue has been thus far, it takes a very sharp left here, though. Uh, at Exposition Station, (laughs) the next scene (laughs) at the mall, there's a huge plastic bubble erected in the center of the mall, and an ADR line says, Well, what is it? A ball filled with real money? Which doesn't really make sense because it's empty right now. (laughs) Reading from a pamphlet, Louise explains that the gross for the day of the mall's first anniversary will be placed in the ball, and whoever guesses closest to the correct dollar amount wins. Not the money, but a two-week all-expenses-paid trip to Hawaii for their entire family. Why does there need to be money? Why not just have a thing full of, like, marbles or beans or something? It doesn't make any sense. Uh, Jane says that if they win, they could sell the tickets but they'd only be splitting four thousand dollars and elaine says they should just become hookers but then jane points out that they'd starve to death because there's twelve thousand college girls giving it away in this town they joke about kidnapping natalie and asking her husband for a hundred thousand dollars in exchange for not giving her back but when the check comes jane and elaine look the other way until louise offers to pay for everything and they thank her at home louise shares her worries that she's going to lose this shop and albert assures her that there's no more money to loan without divulging the whole irs situation he doesn't really explain what happened but he tells her that business is becoming less feasible with the increasing price of medicine he says do you know what i did today louise do you i sold a used flea collar to a cocker spaniel yes and tomorrow i may remove a cat's appendix whether he wants me to remove it or not i think he meant whether he needs it or not because i'm relatively (laughs) sure the cat does not want its appendix removed (laughs) even if it needed it uh, she laughs it off and they start kissing when the doorbell rings and as she leaves to answer it he's like oh ah uh, there's something i meant to tell you <laughs> but it's too late at the door she receives a summons and learns she's being sued by her husband because he has to sue her so that he can prove that this was a business loan 
because otherwise he has to pay taxes on thirty-six thousand uh, dollars. Jane and Robert have a meal at Taco Time, and he seems reticent to have a family so soon. He wishes he had the twenty-five thousand dollars to buy out the store and run it himself. And she blames her grandfather for not losing World War II, which he apparently won single-handedly. Yeah. Uh, so that the U.S. would have gotten reparations and had a better industrial sector. Robert says all he needs is two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and she thinks he's that close to twenty-five k. But then he reveals, no, 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 I meant for your abortion, basically. Yeah. Uh, which is like super dark for the way this conversation was going. Did you say two hundred and fifty thousand dollars? Two hundred fifty dollars. Two hundred fifty dollars. Yeah, but but she says then, you mean you have like she's like know, oh you have twenty four thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars yeah he's like no I have thirty eight dollars or something like that so he's not even trying to save up enough money to buy this store. Louise freaks out on Albert for suing her, not really listening to the financial reasoning, and she's basically going to lose the store either way. At least he's trying to save the house from getting repossessed because if he loans her the money. They're still going to lose the store because he's going to get taxed until he has nothing. And if he doesn't loan her the money, then she's going to lose the store. So it doesn't make a difference. Elaine stops for gas and finds that her credit card has been canceled. She offers to have sex with the gas station attendant, but he does not seem interested for some reason. At home, Jane learns that her mother has left her father for a woman. She tells him that there's a motel just down the street, but he's looking for a cheaper place to stay, a.k.a. here. Uh, Eddie Albert is playing this really creepy. Uh, it, it, he keeps touching her face. Like, it's not fatherly at all. It, it's, <laughs> it's very... And I didn't know... I didn't quite understand what they were trying to say with his bejeweled... Yes! Like, yeah, Jess yes. jacket. confused by that also. Yeah, he's wearing a jean jacket that's got, like, a flag bejeweled on the back. But it's instead of, in lieu of the stars... It has a peace sign. Peace sign. Yeah. I was like, is he also maybe gay? But he was in the military, right? <laughs> yeah. Have, have him and his wife been beards for each other this whole time? <laughs> I um, thought you were the beard. Um, at work in her store, Ye Old Antique Shop, a cop comes in to see Louise, and he presents her with a court order to close the business until the court case has been decided between her and her husband. Because you know the best way to prove that something's a business is to not allow them to sell anything. Yeah, mm. you, get, you need to start turning a profit <laughs> if you don't want us to audit you. Anyway, lock the door <laughs> and then still turn a profit somehow. Jane comes home and finds her son digging through the fridge. She lectures him for not being at his dentist appointment for a while, but eventually the kid explains that the dentist sent him home because they're overdue on a bill. Elaine runs out of gas just outside the mall. Uh, she tries to call AAA or the fake movie version of AAA but can't get through. And uh, she watches a team wiring the lighting for the cash bubble. And when the lights come on, this insane blurring score accompanies the idea striking in her head. And she immediately calls Louise. The three of them meet up outside the ball. And Jane says, I know what you said on the phone, Lane, but it won't work. We've got to make it work. What choice do we have? We have a choice. We can all go back home now and go to sleep implying that she announced her intention to presumably steal the money from this bubble on a phone installed 20 feet away from the display where anyone could have heard her. Well, not only that, they talk about it constantly while yes. walking around in public. <laughs> they continue laying well, it gets out their worse plot. later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. They continue laying out their plot right here loud enough for anyone to hear from across the mall. Louise sounds very pessimistic, but she isn't ruling out the attempt. She says people don't typically get away with this stuff. Jane mentions a Brinks robbery, but Louise points out that they're all in jail now. Louise offers to plan if Elaine handles the execution, which basically leaves Jane out. Again, not Jane Curtin, but Jane person. Uh, Jane volunteers to handle any unnecessary canoeing that may come up. Uh, Elaine speaks on the phone with Louise from her husband's office when a coworker enters. Her missing husband was an architect, and he happens to have the blueprints to the mall in his office good news they won't have to dig the tunnel that they expected to and she ends the call and admits to the man that she's trying to open the locked drawer on her husband's desk because she's just trying to find any kind of a clue i i i really love jane Curtin, and yeah. i really love her snide sneaky smile yeah where, where she's smiling but she has her mouth open a little yeah. bit it, it's it's it kills me every time and she does it in this and, I was and like, she also I, comes across really genuine here and yeah. totally tricks this guy yeah i was like oh man i love you jane Curtin. but uh she doesn't really care where he went she's just asking for him to check this drawer so that she can throw the blueprints out the window into a fountain yeah but the other thing that's weird is that 
I was so sure that the reason that there was already a tunnel to the bubble was because that the people who built this mall had this plan. Like they helped put together that they were going to do this thing and they were going to. So I thought her husband was going to be there to steal this this bubble. Who would have expected upon the opening of the mall that there was going to be a big ball of money in it? Though? A year later. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I, I just, I don't think that they, they put the tunnel there specifically for this, but I think that, I thought it was going to turn out that the reason that the, the husband disappeared was because he noticed that that tunnel led there because he had the blueprints mm. and he was going to steal this money and they were going to run into him and the tunnels under the place. And, and also this tunnel is a conveyor belt to dump garbage into the river. Is it to dump garbage? I guess it is. I guess. It's to dump something into the river. Maybe it's like radiation. Because uh, this is like a Stranger Things mall. I also think it's weird that their plan before she had the plans for the mall was that they were going to dig this tunnel. Like, this this event is happening yeah. in like five days. And yeah. they're going to dig a tunnel under the mall and have nobody find out? Yeah. <laughs> it didn't make any sense before. But it makes slightly less sense now. No, it makes slightly more sense, but still none. So after we see her throw the blueprints out the window and they land on a fountain, we cut to her home where she's blow drying the blueprints and explaining them to Jane and Louise. Uh, I thought for sure that this was going to lead to a situation where one of the lines was going to blur together. Oh, the they were going to get it wrong. They were going to like, yeah, they're going to like, they were going to go down into the tunnels, but there was going to be a wall where they w- shouldn't be. Or... Yeah. It just got washed off. Yeah. Um, according to the map, there is a useful passageway in the back of a shoe store. Uh, Louise scouts it the next day. A pair of employees are complaining that a kid came in with differently sized feet, and the other one says, Must be inherited. Do you see his mother's boobs? Uh, <laughs> she doesn't react to this at all, but she should have been laughing hysterically. Uh, <laughs> but, but it was just such a weird read, too. Did you get a look at her boobs? I was like, uh, uh, all right. I feel like every backroom conversation between two guys at a shoe store ends with, Did you get a look at her boobs? <laughs> Elaine meets with Natalie, and they enter the place where they're rehearsing this pageant that will celebrate the mall as well as the first hundred years of Oregon's history. Uh, There's like a spooky score as Louise is crawling around in the darkness under the mall, and uh, I thought something terrible was about to happen, but she basically follows the tunnel to where it opens onto a lake at this conveyor belt. uh, Yeah, you're right. It's just dumping trash into the water. And Elaine wanders through the pageant area until she finds the master power line for the whole building. At Jane's son's baseball game, Grandpa is playing umpire and calls the kid out at home plate. Or does he call him safe? He calls him out. He calls but, it's him his out. Own, but it is his grandson. Yeah. So he calls him out. And the coach, Jane's ex, and the father of this kid approaches him and shouts at the grandfather for making a bad call and starts shoving him around. Grandpa is delighted. Uh, because this is his former son-in-law and he's wanted to punch him for five years so he punches him once and says that's for touching an umpire and he punches him again that's for leaving my daughter and then he says he punches him a third or kicks him to the ground and he says and that's for making me lose my temper in front of these sweet kids you chicken shit wimp (laughs) the ladies tally up how much money jane will need total twenty-five thousand for robert's shop and then they say ten thousand for max hitler I don't know what that means. I don't know who Max Hitler is. But that Max is Jane's dad. Why are they calling him Hitler? Because he yelled? I guess. But he yelled at her ex-husband who was being shitty and beating on an old man at a kid's baseball game. And $1,000 for Tom's bridge because he will for sure sue. Plan in hand, they have moved on to phase two. Now, hold on though. Sorry. Okay. I, I, <laughs> they're only going over the amount of money... That, that Jane needs. Well, well, well that Jane needs the 10000 for uh, to find her father an apartment. And the shop. No, Luis needs money for the shop. Luis needs... Oh, no, 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 no. The 25000 was for Robert's shop. Her not yet oh, husband's okay. shop. Okay. Yeah, because he, if he was able to scrape up $25,000, he could just buy the manager ticket behind the counter right. and then be the manager okay, magically. So, so then so he would far buy out his boss. Okay. Then so far all the needs that we're getting here is Jane's needs. Yeah. And as I was like, the, I, we're I, not going over Elaine or Louise's yeah, stuff. So I, I was confused. I thought it was Louise's numbers, but yeah. So I was like, well, what about everyone else? Like, I mean, why are we focusing on what, how much money do, do all of them need? Yeah. What is the target amount? Um, we don't know. We <laughs> yeah. don't even know how much they get. Right. So we just move on to phase two. And we basically need to verify that they are psychologically prepared for this robbery. So they put a bunch of 
terrible felonies into a bowl and draw one at random and uh, jane draws stick up a safeway alone so elaine gives her a fake gun and which would bring the possible sentencing down to one to five years instead of five to ten or death if they shoot you Mm -hmm. uh, which they can do if you're an armed robber Uh, when jane pulls the gun on the cashier though the cashier tosses it in with the rest of her groceries assuming correctly that it was a toy jane and elaine head down to a boat rental shack and jane steals a canoe back at the mall elaine notices a janitor with an enormous vacuum bag and he pauses to start smoking a pipe in the middle of the mall i feel like even in 1980 people weren't just smoking pipes in public malls yeah the next night the ladies are driving to a wheeler's store they plan on robbing it this is where robert works and they need a giant vacuum because their plan is to to vacuum all the money out of this ball i thought they were going to use the one at the mall yeah i thought so too it's already in the building i thought that was the whole setup um but uh but that's not the plan they also get different kinds of saws and things that they'll need to uh to complete the plan as they've laid it out there's a disturbing line in which because jane's bringing her kids yeah and she says the last time i left them alone he took pictures of his sibling and sent them into Playboy. Yeah. But they're both boys. No, it's a boy and a girl. It is a boy, is and, it a boy girl? and a girl? Yes, it is a boy and a girl. I thought they were both boys too, no. which I is why I was very confused. The girl this. is named Lori. That's the younger sister. Okay. Uh, and I was like, but that's still horribly disturbing. Yeah. They just gloss over it like it's a joke, but she's basically admitting that her son made child pornography of his sister mm-hmm. and tried to sell it to a pornographer the last time they got left at home. But and so she thinks it's safer now to leave them both in the car in what looks like a pretty shitty neighborhood. Um, well, uh, well, they're going to rob a store. Yeah. The son wakes up and says, Do you want to play Evil Knievel? Sure. Okay. You play Evil and I'll play the motorcycle. Come on. Okay. And I was like, oh, God. Like, <laughs> this kid That's is already follow-up. a fucking pervert and now he's going to rape his sister in this parking lot? <laughs> oh, God. What is happening? The, the ladies are accidentally locked inside the store and set off an alarm when they see the kids playing outside. Luckily, Officer Dabney Coleman, complete incompetent, catches them stealing shit. And Elaine's excuse is that it's a scavenger hunt for charity. <laughs> uh, the store belongs to Jane's quote unquote fiance, which he's not actually her fiance because he hasn't right. agreed to marry her. But, uh, but she has the keys because he does work there. And they point to the kids in the car as proof that they're not robbing the place because they're like, what kind of fucking idiot? would bring two kids to rob a store but he lets them go because they're a bad cop but then there's an implication that that uh elaine jane Curtin's character is going to offer sex to him right and then she says did you see that way i raped that cop yeah and i was like did she have sex with him in the parking lot no i think she felt bad about taking advantage of him here Mm. by using her sex to get away with this but she basically just admits blatantly to drunk driving earlier she's like by the way the the other day when you had me pulled over i was wasted you didn't check or anything but i was so drunk um i was drunk driving and uh here i'm doing something bad too but you gotta let us go you owe me one okay Uh, he says you uh i owe you one and he says you owe me two Mm -hmm. um because for some reason i'm letting you go again uh but yeah at, at this restaurant later again they're at a restaurant spending more money um elaine feels bad for lying and jane feels bad about fucking up the theft of this store uh the cop meets with elaine at her house and he explains that his wife left him apparently in the last week because Mm -hmm. she was home very recently but uh they have a date and sex in her place albert goes out on a date with another woman all of a sudden and he's complaining about louise on this like lover's lane hilltop parking area where everybody is yeah the whole cast of the movie is here except for louise after their last fight uh louise told albert that he was going to be sleeping in the den and apparently he thinks that means they're separated or something because he's just took another woman up to this lover's lane she says that it's taken her seven years to get him up here and uh, a few cars over we see jane and robert speaking in a car Uh, she promises that she will get the money to buy the shop and uh and he says where are you gonna get it and she says my folks and he says your dad asked me for money when i came to pick you up the other night and she says oh i'm gonna get it from my mom and she's like your mom just hawked her wedding ring to buy a crib for her newly adopted son so her parents are poor but she's she insists that she can get this money a few more cars down the line elaine has her foot stuck in the glove compartment 
and Officer Dabney Coleman fears that they'll have to call the fire department. Elaine made them drive up here because she said that the neighbors would notice if he left his police car in front of her house all night. But apparently they took her car, so it's still there. Yep. <laughs> uh, Dabney Coleman goes to find help from another car because he's incompetent. And uh, he pulls Albert out of the car down the way and drags him up to their car. Jane and Elaine notice that Albert is with a, another woman that's not Louise, but he says, hey, don't tell my wife in exchange for me saving Elaine's foot. But he doesn't even save the foot. No, and Jane that's not, does. And that's not how leverage works. Uh, and so it doesn't make any sense. It, it, you don't have anything to hold over their heads after you've pulled this woman's foot out of the glove compartment. But uh, yeah, Jane reaches in from the driver's side and gets the foot out. And uh, the ladies move on to plan the robbery. Yep. What was this all about? No point for this scene. Uh, we're back at Jane's house and the ladies are planning the robbery with three magnets on an empty refrigerator. It was driving Jess crazy. <laughs> I was like, what? How are you planning this? You're just putting magnets on a blank fridge. The only this... reference points are each other. <laughs> it doesn't <laughs> reference anything. Like put them, like literally you can use the magnets to attach the map to this refrigerator. Yeah. But no. No, you're not doing that either. Nope. <laughs> and then now we're going to make a recording, an incriminating yes. recording oh my God. of us planning the robbery. It's yes. worse than talking on the phone in the mall next to the bun- money ball. It's yes. just telling everybody exactly what you're going to do. For some reason, they recite the entire robbery plan into a tape recorder for evidence in case they forget to get caught in the act. Albert gets mad at Louise for leaving without explaining where she's going. But I thought this tape recorder was going to come back into play oh, for some no reason. reason. Like, I mean, if you're not going to just listen to it in your sleep because you like want to like absorb this through osmosis or something. They like, don't even do that. No. I, what is the point of the tape recorder? Uh, just so that they can spell out the plan for oh, us Oh, exposition. To know. Okay, yeah. got it. Got it. Uh, I already knew the plan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thought I did too, actually. They, they, have, <laughs> they, they extensively went through the tunneling system. She found the fuse box. I get it. Yeah. It got the canoe. We get how the plan is coming together. I guess they were trying to point out so that when we see them all being late later, that they had to be certain places at exactly specific times. But it turns out that that didn't matter But that doesn't matter. Mm -mm. Um, But yeah, so Albert gets mad at Louise for trying to leave the house without telling telling him where she's going. She says, If you're worried about eating the food, Albert, don't. I stopped poisoning it two days ago. The hell with the food. At Jane's house... Her son is dealing cards for poker with Grandpa's friends, and her daughter is getting them all beers. Jane tells Grandpa to leave. She fires her babysitter on her way to the robbery. This makes no sense, and nothing they're doing is even mildly inappropriate for kids. Like, kids are supposed to get stuff for you out of the fridge. That's well, half of what they're for at this age. But I think it was the swearing and... But she swears all the time. It doesn't matter. <laughs> anyway, these kids will just be home alone, even though I said I don't do that anymore because my one kid's a pervert. And Elaine is about to leave, but now the power is out in her garage, or I guess the whole house. But uh, she she doesn't know that she can pull a cord and lift the garage door yeah, with a like, counterweight. What, what what is happening? What? So she thinks her car is trapped, and uh, she calls the power company, and he says, "Oh yeah, no, there's there's no power problem in your area. It looks like this bill hasn't been paid." And she says, oh, but it's an emergency. I've, my my mother is, she's in the next room and she has this medical equipment that needs power. And she's, what's that, mama? The machine isn't going to pocket or to pocket or to pocket anymore. Oh, my God. And the guy at the power company is like, that was beautiful. <laughs> like, I've been here so long. I've never heard anybody put so much effort. That was really great. You know what? You could probably head down to the corner store. And she's like, oh, what, what good is that going to do me? He said, they have lovely candles. <laughs> and then she hangs up, or and, he hangs up on her. Yeah, he hangs up laughing maniacally, and his laughter carries over into the transition of the <laughs> yeah. scene, echoing in the air as if his laughter <laughs> could be heard for miles. Yes, it's, a, it's an epic laugh. Elaine decides instead to drive through the garage door. Jane, it turns out, has a flat tire. And a man has stopped to offer her a ride, but she says she's waiting for a station wagon because she has the canoe. <laughs> and the guy says, oh, well, do you have a spare? And she says, no, I sold it to buy Jody a retainer and s- instead of just saying no. No, mm-hmm. I don't have a spare. She, like, gives them this whole backstory. And uh, and he's like, okay, 
I don't know what you want me to do at this point. You're giving me more information. I'm just going to go. He kind of angrily speeds off, though, but I'm like, you know, moments ago you were trying to help this woman in distress. Why are you suddenly so angry? I think I, it's I, because she seems crazy. Or because I, she has kids? I, yeah, so I thought it was like, oh, I'm going to pick up this woman and hit on her, and then he found out that she has kids, and it's like, nope, okay. yeah. I'm done. Because every guy in this movie is horrible. Uh, yeah. Every woman in this movie is horrible. Yeah, everybody is pretty bad. Um, we're back at Louise and Albert's place where apparently now she just knows that he cheated, even though we never got the scene where her friends spill the beans. Uh, and apparently they weren't worried that Albert was going to put her foot back in the glove compartment if she told. <laughs> um, so now she knows and uh, it doesn't really matter because he he just basically like, yeah, you know, I took her on a date, but nothing happened and it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. Um, she doesn't seem to care much, though, anyway. No, she really doesn't. But uh, they're fighting for a while, and then she remembers that she's late for this robbery. So she heads to the mall where the the bubble has a fan running in it now, so it's blowing what what only looked to me like about $4,000 of money blowing around inside this bubble. Um, and it's surrounded by five security guards. Elaine is being lectured for getting to the pageant late, and uh, Natalie's like, you need to get in here. We just freed the slaves. We're almost a state. Where have you been? <laughs> She's like, Oregon didn't have any slaves. Where did you get the slaves? Are you sure? I'm positive. <laughs> She's like, really? They also mentioned that uh, the Indians broke the treaty. And She's like, the goes, Indians oh, broke the it. Indians broke it. <laughs> okay. Um, apparently none of this was rehearsed except for these dance numbers. Louise gets hung up by running into Dabney Coleman and doesn't make it to the shoe store before they close. She sneaks through a window between conjoined bathrooms from the next door over and she manages to get back to that hidden hallway jane is just canoeing for the mall because she doesn't have a car anymore there was a funny bit where you see a car uh, stopped along the road with a canoe on the roof and it looks like or the, the angle it looks like the canoe's on the roof but yeah then the car pulls yeah. away and it's just jane waiting for the light to change so yeah. she can cross the street i really liked that shot she throws up over the side of the canoe in this river but as a joke, the editor put in a fart sound instead of the sound of vomit hitting the water. <laughs> I don't understand. I played it back a couple of times. It's definitely a fart sound. With the money ball now completely filled, it looks like it has a max $5,000. But apparently this was $240,000 because money doesn't look like a lot of money when you put it in this big of a shape. Well, every every time it stops on a bill, it's like a one or a five. Yeah. Uh, you I would know, have gone with all ones for that two hundred fifty. Might have actually looked like it was a lot of money. At that maybe point. that was difficult to to come together. I think, the, the, but the only reason that it's blowing around in circles like this is so that the ball doesn't look completely empty. Because <laughs> a couple times this fan turns off and then it drops to looking almost like there's no money in it. From underneath this transparent ball, where the guards could very plainly see her, Louise starts drilling a hole right in the middle of this event with everyone watching know how you don't hear that she's got a hole saw that she's drilling up through the bottom of this you know plastic ball it would be just going yeah you know but she's also looking up at it there's like a big like three foot wide circle of transparent like she can see all the guards mm -hmm. all around the bubble so there's no way they can't just look down and see the woman with a drill touching the bottom of this bubble it's and, transparent and if they hear her scream right. they have to be able to hear the drill right, right? So she sees a rat down here and loses it, and all the security goes on high alert. Elaine flips what she thought was the master switch for the power, but only the stage light for the pageant go out. Elaine takes the stage to try to distract everyone from what Louise is doing. Jane meets with Louise under the ball, but somehow they're also right at the mouth of the river. Like the ball is immediately right. next to where it, it, but it can't be because there's stores in every direction and it's really mm -hmm. far from where water could be. But this seems like it's an actual place. Yeah. Like th this conveyor belt is part of some kind of facility. Yeah. Elaine decides that she's going to do a strip tease on the stage for the pageant show as they plug the vacuum into the ball. It's very clearly not working. It's not getting anything out of this ball, but you know, we're using our imagination here. The guards are tripping over each other to get to the topless woman, and then they accidentally knock over this giant pole with lights on it which just crushes the bubble and money flies everywhere. Well, it also had the crazy lady with the gun earlier on top of the pole. Yeah. yeah. Because that lady had climbed to the top of the pole to, I don't know what, turn on a light, even though there was no electricity. Well, I think it was the light for the ball. Oh, she was going to turn yeah, it at so, the but stage. But she pointed instead. it at the stage. Yeah. yeah. But then, so she's this like 
you know, she's counterweighting this whole thing over and she smashes into the ball. Yeah. But since everything's going crazy, Louise says, we just need to leave with what we've got so far and ties off the two bags. Uh, Louise stands in the canoe as they're heading out of the river and it tips over and Louise can't swim. So Jane has to rescue her as the money floats away. But uh, even though we reveal immediately later that this water is only a foot deep. Yeah, they're standing up in it. Um, instead of putting her clothes back on, Elaine wears a curtain for the next 12 hours. A Jane curtain? Oh. Yeah, she wears a Jane curtain <laughs> uh, until she finds the other girls sitting on this bank outside where the where the where they escaped with the money. And a bag floats by while they're arguing. But they've been sitting here for 12 hours just thinking about what went wrong. Yeah. It was nighttime and now it's daytime. So they just, they got up on the shore and they were like, shouldn't we go home? Shouldn't we go find our friend and tell her what happened? Shouldn't we go downstream no, and wanna... look for the bags of yeah. money? Why were those bags floating? Mon- no, they were like, tied off. There's enough air in it. I guess. That, that <clears> seems <throat> like the weight of all that money. But either way, while they're arguing about it, a bag floats by here and uh, Louise decides she's going to get it and she almost drowns again. So one of them goes for the money and one of them goes for Louise officer coleman comes to her house later um, and they've successfully retrieved one bag so uh elaine is upstairs just counting all the money on her bed and uh now question yes is this all of the money or is this just elaine's money i thought it was her third. i think it's her third okay which she shouldn't have to count yeah. because they should have counted it already and then split it into thirds right but she's counting it here and he gets to the door and he's like, hey, I just wanted to check up on you, see how you're doing. I've been super hard since that show you did yesterday. And he doesn't ask about like, by the way, I couldn't help but notice your garage door exploded. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's kind of weird. But instead he's just like, hey, so we should have sex right. And she says, well, I don't, I, I want to hang out with someone who's interested in a date that's longer than 12 minutes or something like that. Because she doesn't just want to have sex with this guy. And he says, okay, so what do you want me to do? And she's like, how about date me like a real person? Here's my number. And he goes out to the squad car, which has a phone in it, and he calls up to the house and asks her out. And she accepts for some reason. Not clear why. Um, Albert tells Louise that the IRS magically changed their mind about the taxes, even though they had the money now to pay the taxes. Yep. Doesn't make any sense, but they're in the clear. And and as long as the store turns a profit? Yeah. So is the implication here that she's just going to use all this money that she got to just fake profits for the store? I guess. Jane and Robert are apparently married now. It sounds like she bought the shop after all. And uh, he asks where she got the money and she tells him the truth, which of course he doesn't believe because it's not a very believable plot. And that's the end of the film. This was directed by Robert Shearer. This was his last feature credit. It's mostly TV work before that. A lot of fame series, Star Trek shows. He did Next Gen, Deep Space Nine, Voyager. Um, The writer here was Robert Kaufman. He did Divorce American Style, Freebie and the Bean, uh, a couple of Dr. Goldfoot movies. Uh, He also wrote the second Happy Hooker movie, Goes to Washington, and Nothing Personal, also for American International. It did feel a lot like Nothing Personal. I agree. Mm -hmm. The story was by Leonora Thuna. This is her only feature credit. And uh, she also has a creator credit on the series The Good Time Girls. Uh, Susan St. James was Jane here. She has an uncredited role as Mrs. Martha Kidd in the Cockeyed Cowboys of Calico County. She is back in Carbon Copy next year, which I know we're all evaluating our 1981 reviews. Have you watched the trailer for that one yet? Carbon Carbon Copy. Copy. I can't recall. It's about George Seagal learning he has a son, and the son is played by the feature film debut of Denzel Washington. Yes. I know Um, it's the feature film debut. Spoiler alert, I did not rank that one uh, very well. All right. We'll see. (laughs) We'll see what happens with that. And uh, Susan St. James also appeared with Jane Curtin as the leads of 122 episodes of Kate and Allie, a show I had never heard of until I looked that up. What Uh, years were that? I don't know. It was uh, 85 through 89. Jane Curtin was Elaine. This was her first feature film credit. 
it's our second movie in a row with a lead character directed by our friend Susanna Fogel because Jane Curtin played Kate McKinnon's mom in The Spy Who Dumped Me. Oh, that's awesome. She was also Dr. Mary Albright on Third Rock from the Sun. Yeah. She's in the the first three librarian films with Noah Wiley. I think there's more than three, and then there's the show, but I don't think she's in anything beyond the third movie. Uh, she was a Weekend Update anchor and Conehead on Saturday Night Live and in the Coneheads movie. Uh, she wasn't a Weekend Update anchor in the Coneheads movie, I don't right. think. Uh, Jessica Lang was Louise. Uh, she was Dwan in the 76 King Kong. She's Julie in Tootsie with Dabney Coleman. Uh, she plays older Sandra Bloom in Big Fish, Tamara in Titus, and lately she's in a lot of American Horror Story stuff. She also was in that uh, feud Betty and Joan where she played Joan Crawford. Mm -hmm. uh, Richard Benjamin was Albert. We had him earlier this year in Last Married Couple as Marv Cooper. Okay. Uh, um Oddly playing the similar kind of character. Yeah, very similar character. Um, he's also Peter Martin in Westworld. Um, he'll be back later this year for Witch's Brew and First Family. And uh, he's a director of a lot of films that start with M, like My Favorite Year, Money Pit, My Stepmother's an Alien, Mermaids, Made in America, Milk Money, Mrs. Winterborn, and Marcy X. Um, he, and the tra we watched the trailer for that one from Diary of a uh, Mad Housewife. Yeah, Diary of a Mad Housewife, and, and it sounds a, like the he's same got as the this movie. exact same character. Yeah, um, Eddie Albert was Max. Uh, he played Oliver Wendell Douglas on Green Acres mm -hmm. and Petticoat Junction, and also in one episode of Beverly Hillbillies. Um, he's Irving Radovich from Roman Holiday, and he'll be back as Daggett in Fooling Around later this year. Uh, he was also in John Ford's Seven Women with Sue Lyon, who was an alligator, uh, and Lolita. Uh, Catherine Damon played Natalie. She has mostly TV credits, but she'll be back as Gloria in The First Time and then as Gail Bainbridge in She's Having a Baby over the course of the 80s. Dabney Coleman was Jack Heitzel. He's Franklin Hart Jr. in 9 to 5 later this year. He also still has Melvin and Howard in 1980. We previously had him in our last American International Picture Nothing Personal. And uh, he's also going to appear in Tootsie, War Games, Cloak and Dagger. And he was obviously Mr. Drysdale in the 93 Beverly Hillbillies, which uh, we failed to mention when we were going over uh, credits for Cloris Leachman where she gets called Granny. Yeah. Uh, that's another one, uh, classic. The cast of that movie is perfect. Yeah, it really is great. Fred Willard was Robert. He's Ed Harkin in, in both Anchorman films. He is Shelby Forthright in Wally, which is, is he the president or is he just a spokesperson for By and Large? Uh, I think he's the owner or the CEO of By and Large. He's also Frank Dunphy on Modern Family, which I don't watch. Uh, he's in a lot of Christopher Guest movies. And and he's not funny in this movie. No, not really. Which, which is like Fred Willard I usually associate with being somewhat funny. Um, and he's currently in pre-production on the new Space Force series as a character named Fred Naird. He has 311 credits on IMDb. Yeah. He is prolific. He works a lot. Yeah, it, it is a bummer, though, because he is so funny. And I feel like this is a situation where the director probably specifically was like, can we do that again? But can we just get a straight one from you, Fred? Because mm -hmm. and it's like, no, no, no. Let him be funny. He's really funny. Art Matrano. Oh, sorry. I was gonna say like uh, Richard Benjamin. Uh, oh, when he I'm, does stuff all over the place. Yeah. Yeah, I was like, I was like, this is what I would expect from Fred Willard. Yeah. Uh, I really like Richard Benjamin a lot. Yeah, he 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 is a lot of fun. He's hamming it up, but in the best ways. Yeah. Um, Art Matrano was the gas station attendant. He's Mauser in the Police Academy movies. He was also Leonardo da Vinci in History of the World Part One. So that's the second Leonardo da Vinci that we've had <laughs> after Small Circle wasn't of Friends. the friends. other one, yeah. Um, Michael Bell was Tom. Uh, he's lots of Hasbro voices in various Transformers and G.I. Mm -hmm. Joe variations. Yeah. He's also the voice of Drew Pickles and Chaz Finster in Rugrats, um, including stuff that's happening right now. Drew Pickles is obviously Tommy Pickles' younger brother, who has a voice when he's in the all-grown-up version, and Chaz Finster is Chucky's father. Um, he's also the voice of Quacker Jack in the new DuckTales series. Uh, Sybil Danning was Charlotte. Wait, well, I think he was the original. Maybe he's in both Quacker then. Jack, wasn't he? Yeah. Is it in the new one too? Yeah. He's in both? He's in both. Okay. Uh, Sybil Danning was Charlotte. Uh, she plays St. Expan in Battle Beyond the Stars mm -hmm. from recent screenwriter John Sayles. She's also Queen Lara in Amazon Women on the Moon. 
uh, Adriana in Hercules, and she will also be back for The Man with Bogart's Face and Night Kill later this year. Well, we're not going to talk about The Howling 2, Your Sister's a Werewolf. Is she in that one? She is the sister. She's the titular sister <laughs> well, werewolf. She's the titular sister who also shows her titulars. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, yeah, she plays Sturba, because I believe that's the foreign title. Sturba? T- yeah. The foreign title is Sturba Werewolf Bitch. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, Garrett Morris was the Power and Light Man. Uh, this guy was great. Uh, he's obviously a fellow SNL cast member with Jane Curtin. Uh, he's Captain Orr Cruiser in the Coneheads movie, also with Jane Curtin. And he was in the movie Ant-Man. Uh, he was a cab driver when uh, Ant-Man like hits the roof of his car and he looks up and he notices this weird little dent in the ceiling. Mm. Um, and this is because he was cast in this part because he was the first person to play Ant-Man ever um, on television or film because he was Ant-Man in an SNL sketch. <laughs> and they looked him up and they were like, has anyone played Ant-Man before? Oh, he was in an SNL sketch. And they were like, we need to get him to come in and play a bit part in this movie. So uh, he's in there. Byron Morrow was Charlie Goldring. Um, I'm not sure who that is. Who's Charlie Goldring? Anyway, this was his last film credit. And he played the Secretary of State in Colossus the Forbin Project. Oh. Yeah, this movie's a bit of a mess. The the characters are all pretty insulting, and you're, you're not really rooting for them because they're all making terrible decisions the whole time. No, the writing in this movie was infuriating. I think that all of the women were written so poorly. They were a terrible combination of just completely inept and stereotypical, badly written women in movies. It's yeah. just It was just hard to watch. And even Dabney Coleman can't save this stupid cop character either. Mm-hmm. Like, the, they don't make him dumb enough in the regular conversations to warrant all the really stupid shit he does over the course of the whole movie. I th- I thought for sure one of these characters was going to be brought in on the caper. Yeah. Like, as like, oh, like, is Dabney Coleman going to be like a really, like, frustrated cop and they're going to bring him in and he's going to be part of it? Or he's yeah. going well, to help them get away with something Jane later? Jane does tell her husband at the end how she got the money but he thinks she's lying Mm -hmm. yeah and uh, technically speaking dabney does let them get away with things yeah but he has no idea what their plan is he's just like sure steal a vacuum i don't give a shit if you're gonna give me a hand job that's fine and the other thing that really bothered me about this movie is i don't think it knew what it wanted to be yeah because it wasn't a caper movie and honestly i think if you cut a bunch of it out and you leaned in a little bit more to the idea that it was like a kooky caper it might have been more entertaining but it it just it wavered a lot on what it was trying to be it focused a lot on the first third of just what why why these women's lives were so difficult and why they need money well that's the other thing is that i feel like they don't do a good enough job to make it seem like their shitty situation isn't their fault because about halfway through the movie i turned to you and i said aside from the antique store which isn't really a job because she has no customers do any of these three women have jobs i don't think they do one of them has two kids and she doesn't have a job she's living off of 200 dollars a month for child support but she does have a boyfriend with a job but she's not bringing in enough money to you know pay for the house and keep the kids uh healthy and their teeth good um and then the jane Curtin character says that she doesn't cook enough for her husband and that she doesn't that she spends too much of his money shopping which implies that it's not her money that she's spending shopping so she doesn't have a job either and none of the three of them are looking at getting a job that makes them money as the answer to this problem so i feel like it's really hard for the audience to sympathize with them when you're like just get a job if you don't have any money like like i don't have any money but i don't want to work either they tried to layer in a bunch of stuff about inflation in here to try to make it i guess them feel more sympathetic in terms of them having money problems because at the beginning jane's complaining that oh no uh you know inflation was only you know 11 percent instead of 13 percent, and so i can you know bread's only going to be five dollars a you know a loaf at the store instead And, and i get that it's like at that point it's too it's too much to go back and add a job for each of these people and show their shitty boss cheating them out of money and that they deserve it even more and that they're working really hard but just a line just some kind of a line like oh I, at the diner today they took all my tips because 
uh, they haven't been having as many customers lately or something like that. Or just like just throw one little thing in there that implies they're working and getting ripped off. Because right now it just seems like they refuse to get jobs, so they s- robbed a sh- shopping mall, basically. Well, and inflation is everyone's problem. Right. Yeah. Because, you know, even Albert is saying, like, you know, you know med- medic- medications for these animals is c- going up. And I'm having to do unnecessary surgeries yeah. on, on pets in order to in order to get money to pay the bills. Yeah. And that's even the point of the money ball is that they're talking about infusing the the local community with more money because they're trying to bring down the inflationary problems that the entire economy is facing. But um but for some reason only these three women deserve all the money in this ball. But because of the craziness that went on around it, nobody even knows that this money's missing. Yeah, they, also, there's still a bag of hundreds of thousands of dollars right. floating down the river. So nobody knows that it's missing and they said oh because it was an accident insurance covered all of the money that went missing because mm-hmm. the the crowd just went crazy and started picking yeah. up the money when it's when the ball smashed open and so yeah. the insurance covered everything so there is just no consequences in this film right yeah uh i i did like davney coleman's a uh, moment where he takes his hat off and scoops up one of the bills into his hat and puts it back on. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, okay, that was kind of funny, but it was probably at the most like a five or a 10. Yeah. The insurance line of all this money that, that was stolen by the people who's going to be covered by insurance is like, I don't know if. Yeah. Can you buy be? insurance where you're like, Hey, we want insurance on cash. Mm-hmm. Like we're going to get $240,000 <laughs> of cash. And if it disappears, can we have $240,000 of cash? Also, like, we're going to sure. stick it in a giant glass ball around a whole bunch of yeah. people and just expect everything to be fine. Yeah. Also, a woman got topless in a public space. And didn't get arrested and for it. didn't get arrested. After robbing a hardware store and drinking and driving. And it's the same cop witnessed all three crimes. Like, she she could be, the, those are, two of those are felonies, right? <laughs> she could be in prison forever. But she's not going to be. Because she's keeping Dabney happy. Up or down, Jess? Uh, it's a down. As much as I like uh, Jane Curtin, and I like Jessica I like the whole Lang, cast. But I just, uh, I couldn't get behind the writing in this movie. Yeah, the, the, the I like every member of this group. I just wish that they had more to do. Although Susan St. James really isn't bringing much to the table either. Uh, for one of the, the, you know, the center points of the film, Jane Curtin is very funny and you know jessica lang is doing a lot of great stuff and susan st james is kind of a drag every time she's on Mm -hmm. screen she really doesn't doesn't provide much what about you is it down yeah Yeah. i uh, i laughed one time otherwise i was just like not interested or there's just so many unnecessary scenes uh and i completely agree with jesse with like this should have been a caber movie or uh, a topical s- like yeah, yeah political statement yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um where's this going on the list richard um i am putting this well, uh, I, you didn't say i presume oh. it's down for you oh i did say down i thought oh, sorry. But okay. yes no well, down for down. me it's down i'm telling you <laughs> i'm telling you that it's <laughs> you were down. instructing me what my opinion is um i'm gonna put this um just above rough cut and just below the hollywood nights okay jess um I think it's a little lower for me so this does not make the windows threshold for me yeah i'm gonna put this below holy moses and above don't answer the phone okay uh that seems like blasphemy to me um i'm gonna put this above can't stop the music and just below the private eyes but i think that's about everything for this one if you guys have any thoughts you'd like to share with us, we are Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterboxd, where, as I said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at VintageVideoPodcast.com. Please consider rating us on iTunes to help people find the show, and if you take the time to leave us a review, we will thank you personally in an upcoming episode. If you're feeling especially generous, you can support the show through Patreon.com slash VintageVideoPodcast. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing Oh Heavenly Dog, starring Chevy Chase and Benji, yes, that Benji, in a film IMDb describes like so, a murdered detective must avenge his murder after he is reincarnated as a dog. Oh dear. We leave you now with the trailer for Oh Heavenly Dog. Hey, hey, no, no. Hey, Chevy Chase is Benjamin Browning. 
a struggling private eye who's about to embark on the strangest case of his career. What can I do for you? I want to buy protection for someone. And I know you'd be discreet. But before he can track down the clues, the witnesses, the evidence, or the suspects, there's some good news and some bad news. The good news is... Call me on Friday. He's going to make a date. Call you Friday. The bad news is he's going to be late. Now, if you just sign here... What am I signing? You're acknowledging that you are dead and you agree to all the terms and conditions thereof. But, incredibly enough, there's more news. Final assessment assignment is to go back and solve your own murder. Go back. <laughs> Excuse me. Wait a minute. Those are animals. I'm not going back as an animal. And now... Hello? He's back. Maybe you remember me? I was killed here? Somewhat shorter. I need a clue. But wiser. A pair of hands. With 48 wild and woolly hours to solve his own murder or die again trying. 20th Century Fox presents... I'm sorry, Mr. Browning. I didn't mean to startle you. Chevy Chase. Why don't you stand up? I am standing up. Jane Seymour. How about if I just call you BJ for short? You're asking for it. Omar Sharif. Come here. Uh, sorry, I gotta be running along now. Oh, you're strangling me. Robert Morley. And Benji. Hey, hello. Now I gotta run. Turn the lights off when you leave. In an adult tale of murder, mystery, and forbidden love. I don't like being cute. I don't like being fluffy. I want some hands. Oh, heavenly dog.